Uh, welcome, first of all, to the presentation of this annual um, McJanet Prize Award Ceremony. And uh, we look forward to meeting the awardees in a few moments. But before I start saying anything about the uh, award and how we made the selection, um, let me just go back. I was just casting my mind back to an example, the earliest example I know of university social engagement involving a foundation. Now, hands up here, and shame on if you don't know, anybody who's ever heard of the Clapham sect? The Clapham sect? Nobody. Now, you'll find out why you're ashamed in a few moments. One of the members of the Clapham, on this, the Clapham sect was a group of bankers, in other words, foundations, in those days. This was in the 1750s, by the way. You remember it well. Um, uh, bankers, politicians, and in those days, university people who were also clergymen in those days. You had to be. If you were a member of Oxford and Cambridge, you couldn't not be a clergyman. And one of those academics was a man called Charles Simeon. Has anybody ever heard of Charles Simeon? I can't believe this. He is my hero, absolutely hero. He was a fellow of King's College, Cambridge, and you must have heard of King's College, Cambridge. Yes, okay. He of the, the annual carol service. Well, it turns out, actually, King's is quite a left-wing institution and has always been one of the leaders of social interaction, funnily enough. You wouldn't think so when you see all the robes on the carol service and all that lot. But I can tell you, the, certainly I knew several of the guys there, and I still go and eat there sometimes. Uh, it is pretty left-wing. Um, and uh, anyway, this guy, Charles Simeon, was a member of that college, but he was also vicar of a local church called Holy Trinity Church, right in the center of Cambridge by Market Square. Uh, and he was so revolutionary in talking about involvement with the ordinary people that the members of his church locked him out. So he used to speak from the, from the doors in the general public area. And one day, he heard about a village where the villagers had no bread. So he, as an academic, got on his horse and took bread to the villagers. Okay, so social engagement of the university in the 1750s. He was also a member of the Clapham sect. Who was the most famous member? William Wilberforce. And the Clapham sect sponsored the abolition of slavery bill. That's why you should be ashamed that you don't know about it. Also, it set up uh, colleges in India. Um, St. Stephen's being, I think, the first one. So that was the first example, and I thought I'd just show off. I know a little bit of history about the, the, the movement of social engagement. But if you, don't, if you want an inspiring read, go and read what they did. They, they made a lot of mistakes, too. They set up Sierra Leone and, uh, and made an absolute howler of that, to bring slaves back from Africa. But anyway, most of what they did, they got right. Well, welcome again, as I said, to the annual McJanet Prize giving ceremony, and we really want to get on with the action, don't we? It was first established by the, uh, the interaction between the Foundation and the Talwar Network uh, back in 2009 uh, to recognize exceptional student civic engagement initiatives um, at various members of the network itself and in their institutions, and to keep um, contributing financially to the prize-winning projects. And for that, we're very grateful for this interaction uh, with the McJanet um, Foundation. So thank you very much to the McJanet Foundation for keeping this prize going. Now, I'm on the Title Wars Steering Group. Actually, I don't think I am anymore. I came off yesterday, didn't I? <laughs> but anyway, for the purposes here, I'm on the Steering Group. And we're delighted with this ongoing collaboration that has gone on, as I said, for uh, five years so far. Now, the number of applications we had this year was over 50, um, and we have to choose. And that's always a very unfortunate thing, because you don't want to discourage people. You want to say, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. Or I should say, I, I was going to say Charles Simeon was the Adam Habib of his day, by the way. You know, he was a real rabble writer of the time. Anyway, so in choosing, obviously, is very challenging, and there are no losers. They were just winners, but those that didn't get the prize, we are very grateful for them. We're also very grateful to the uh, committee that selected the prize winners and their partner organizations, and uh, from whom the foundation chose this year's awardees. 
As I said, the quality of so many of these projects is so high, it's really very heart-wrenching to actually have to choose. Um, and it's strong evidence, too, that the involvement is growing year by year, and may, long may it be encouraged. And uh, you were able to read about the awardees, uh, uh, what they've done to get the prize from the Talwa network, um, uh, network website, so you can see that. So I'm going to... I've talked too long, but don't forget Charles Simeon in the Clapham sect. He was the first thing I... No. That's why I'm a bit passionate about him. Um, actually, I'd never heard of him before I went to Cambridge, so you can be forgiven. So, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine said, I can't believe you don't know about it. Anyway, I'd now like to introduce Venka Toman, the um, vice president of the McJanet Foundation, to speak on behalf of the foundation and to introduce the worthy prize winners. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Venka Toman, and I'm a trustee of the McJanet Foundation. I'm also a vice president and a vice president of, de of development, so I'm in charge of trying to raise some money for our foundation as well. I'm extremely privileged to be here in beautiful Cape Town and, and Stellenbosch. Uh, and South Africa, amongst so many distinguished representatives of the Talwar Network academic community and the impressive McJanet prize winners. Donald and Charlotte McJanet would be amazed and proud that their name graces the McJanet Prize. They were global citizens before there was a United Nations. Donald McJanet launched his humanitarian career following World War I with a noble but limited vision to build bridges between America and France. First uh, through his small international school in Paris, and then in 1932 with a summer camp located on the beautiful shores of Lake Annecy in a village called Talwar. By the time he died in 1986, Donald and his German-born wife, Charlotte, expanded their vision to embrace people of all backgrounds and numerous nationalities. Their coeducational schools promoted hands-on and experiential learning. They believed in physical hard work, creativity, and the solitary effects of exposure to natural beauty. They were problem solvers. And above all, they were listeners, and they developed a legion of students and campers who never forgot the life lessons they learned. And in fact, many of the students have become passionate about carrying on their legacy. Our own Dr. Robert Hollister, one of the architects of the Talwar Network, was a camper at the McJanet camp in the late 1950s. And my former husband and I were recipients of a scholarship that allowed us to study in Geneva, Switzerland in 1967 and 68. I never forgot that experience and have worked tirelessly to enable students to have an opportunity to study abroad. Donald and Charlotte McJanet were not wealthy, but they were rich, rich with big ideas, ideas that started small and became global. The summer camp was closed in 1963, and another chapter began. Mr. and Mrs. McJanet bought a beautiful, crumbling 12th century priore in Talwar, not far from the old campsite. Donald recruited visitors, former campers, friends, anyone to help in the restoration. The priory became a sanctuary for writers and poets, international symposiums, and cultural events of all kinds. Donald McJanet, a Tufts graduate, made sure that the presidents of Tufts University came to visit. The Max and Dr. Jean Mayer held the first international meeting of University Presidents Conference in the early 1980s. I'm afraid I couldn't find the exact date. How prescient. This was really the forerunner of the Talwar network. As some of you know, the Max donated the Priory to Tufts University, 
and it is one of the most successful remote campuses of any university in North America. In 1968, the McJanet Foundation was formed with a corpus of $50,000. Hmm. What could we do with such an amount? Did I mention that the McJanets were frugal? They could stretch a penny a mile. And when there was not enough money, Mrs. McJanet would say, heaven will provide, and it usually did. The foundation relies heavily on volunteers to run the organization. And our philosophy is to use small grants to seed programs that will grow and prosper, if the idea is right. We helped bring English language programs into French local schools, helped found the Les Amis de Priere so that local groups could use the, tel uh, the, the Priere. We give stipends to students who were worthy but lacked financial ability to study at the Priere in exchange for some hours of service helping to maintain the structure. Building a, a community of global citizens, that is the mission of the McJanet Foundation. Most of the programs we seeded are now fully mature and don't need much help from us. And which brings me to the next chapter of the McJanet legacy, the McJanet Prize. I apologize that it took a few minutes to get there, to get to the main topic of this afternoon, but I want you to have some context of the McJanet uh, Prize. The Talwar Network is a shining example of an idea that has become a huge success. I'm in awe and honored to be standing here today. Faculties and students engaging in the, with their local communities. This is the end product, service and experiential learning. This is global stewardship and citizenship. This is why we send our children to university. This is why we learn. This is what mattered to the McJanets. The McJanet Prize was launched in 2008. We awarded the first prize in 2009. Since the inception of the McJanet Prize, there have been 400 nominations from 303 universities from 136 countries vying for the McJanet Prizes. These programs have involved thousands of faculty, students, and community members. Impressive indeed. We could not appreciate then how meaningful it would become, not only to the 38 programs that have been recognized as winners of the McJanet Prize, but for the peer and the community recognition that the prize recipients have garnered and the press coverage that the prize has attracted for the universities and uh, participating student programs. And finally, the prize winners have been able to meet and share and compare experiences and to discover, despite their geographical and language differences, they learn from each other much, uh, especially how to overcome the common challenges and share their best practices. The Talwar Network and the McJanet Prize have moved the bar and have heightened public, private, and governmental awareness across the globe about the value of community engagement and the importance of the commitment of universities to elevate civic engagement around the world. Now let's get, turn our attention to the 2014 McJanet Prize winners. The first prize, and excuse me, Maureen, should we ask the students to come in up one at a time? Or should I just read them off and then people will come up? Good, okay. Um, the first prize uh, goes to the University of Manitoba in Canada, the Rec and Read Mentorship Program. The um, winners, are the names of the representatives from the university here today are uh, Sanya Morissette, Heather McRae, and Pinar Eskolugu. This I'm a Canadian too, so very proud. Um, the second prize uh, goes to the Legal Service Clinic, the National Law School of, uh, Law School of India, state of Karnatkatka. 
And the names of the um, participants involved are Professor Venkata Rao, um, Professor Patil, and the student uh, representative here today is Bas Savan. Third prize goes to the WITS Initiative for Rural Health Education, University of Witwatersrand, North Pro West Province, South Africa. And the representatives are Nitski Mapukata uh, Sando Sandozaba, and the student representative is Talago Nawak, sorry, Nagwat. Wanto. I also want to mention uh, the honorable mentions. The, on, the fourth uh, or the first honorable mention goes to um, the Centro de Sarolo Comunal, University of Sipan, Peru, and the fifth, the second honorable mention goes to Pathways of Higher Education, University Atenco de Manila, Philippines. Congratulations to all the prize winners. <laughs> and now I'd like you to step up and receive your certificates. I think next we're going to hear from the uh, universities themselves and they'll discuss their programs. Thank you. Our university and our president has exercised a lot of leadership in terms of how the university can respond and be a real concrete or play a concrete role in developing transformative pathways to and through education for our indigenous youth and our, uh, you know, our indigenous population here in the province. Our ideal would be to have everyone involved in community education. And in fact, many students are involved through projects that they do, through classes that they engage in, uh, uh, in learning opportunities in the community, through extracurricular things that they do in the community. For example, some of our sports teams who are already doing things together uh, we'll go and do things in the community for the benefit of younger children and so on. We have had an amazing range of engagement from students, but also from faculty members and from staff. So our ideal is that all faculty members and all students would be engaged in, uh, uh, in the community, whether it's immediately adjacent to us or more broadly, internationally, nationally. Could you consider the month the incredible wealth of community engagement projects that are happening around the world and to be recognized by the Botanic Foundation, which has a history of investing in community engagement and service learning and building those ties between the university and community. 
it, it's just like a completely unexpected gift for all of us in our program. I think that this recognition is, uh, is a wonderful recognition of the work that, uh, uh, that Professor Hallis and her team have done, and it's an encouragement to everyone else who's here, and it's really a humbling experience to think that, uh, that this university and this project has been recognized internationally through in such a prestigious project. On behalf of the University of Manitoba, I'd like to thank the Power Network and the McDonough Foundation for awarding to the Recognition Program here at the University of Manitoba this year's McDonough Prize. Good evening. Afternoon. My name is Sonia Morissette, and I am the program coordinator for the Reck and Read Mentorship Program. Thank you to the McJanet Foundation and Talwar Network Committee. To receive the 2014 McJanet Award is a remarkable and humbling privilege. All of our youth and university mentors are honored that the Reck and Read Mentorship Program is being recognized this evening by the McJanet Foundation and Talwar Network. It seems surreal that our tiny program, which for many years has operated quietly in the community with little fanfare, is now being dignified by international leaders in a country over 9,000 miles from home. Never in our collective imagination could we conceive such a moment. And now that it is here, it is hard to describe how humble we feel. Hello, my name is Heather McCrae and I am a community scholar working with the Reck and Read Mentorship Program. Since there is a very nice description of Reck and Read in the booklet that was handed out, and because it's impossible to describe, it's a strange, describe its strangely complex simplicity in only a few minutes, I will share some of the reasons why Sonia, Pinar, and I are so very proud to be part of Reck and Read. First, Reck and Read is a strength-based program that is rooted in Indigenous teachings. Second, it is a communal mentorship program that builds relationships between university students, community members, high school, and elementary students. Third, it builds intercultural understanding. We address difficult issues in our program and in our service learning course, such as privilege and oppression, and how power shapes intercultural relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. And fourth, it's because in the program we believe that humility is the cornerstone of leadership. Respect, relevance, responsibility, and reciprocity are four key teachings in our program. Part of these teachings include honoring those who walk beside you and upon whose path you now tread. In this spirit, Sonia Pinar and I would like to thank the following people. Number one is the remarkably determined, humble, and kind-hearted Dr. Joni Hallis. She's the co-founder of Reck and Read, and Reck and Read started out of a participatory action research project that she began. The second, we would like to thank our 20 urban and rural remote high school and elementary school partners with special thanks to all of our teacher champions, and they are many. Third, we thank our Indigenous cultural teachers, our elders, and our community leaders, and we also thank our program funders. They keep us connected to our shared histories and our traditions, and they help sustain us now and in the future. And fourth, we thank over 1,600 high school, elementary, and university mentors who have helped create such a great program over the past 10 years. And we thank them because they have inspired us to pursue our current dream, which is now slowly becoming a reality of turning Reck and Read into an Aboriginal Studies course that will be offered in every school in Manitoba. And we thank McJanet for that recognition because it helps us along the way. John Wood and uh, Venkin 
Tolman. Uh, on behalf of the Rec and Read Mentorship Program, we would like to offer the McJanet Foundation and Talwar Network a small bundle of the four traditional Aboriginal medicines used for smudging. Smudging is a traditional Aboriginal activity that we teach within our programs. The bundle consists of tobacco, sage, cedar, and sweetgrass. The medicines are used either on their own or together for smudging oneself for purification and to live and work in a good way. We will strive to uphold the values and ideals described in the Talwar de de uh, Declaration in our work. So thank you again for the wonderful honor. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, so I'm the convener of the Legal Services Clinic at the National Law School, Bangalore, India. And uh, uh, I, uh, firstly, I want to thank uh, Maureen and uh, Jennifer for answering our endless emails and all the queries. <laughs> I hope we didn't bombard with you. <laughs> and um, I, think, I, I think I'll just give a brief overview of our clinic, and then I will just go to the ceremony. And uh, yeah, you can read. Yeah. And uh, Professor Patil is our faculty advisor here, and this is Professor Venkatao, he's our vice chancellor. And uh, what you see here is the pro bono panel assisted by the pro bono panel consisting of the practicing lawyers. The pro bono panels are actually the law school alumni who are practicing at the high courts and the supreme courts, and who, ass who assist us in taking up cases. And we, we have gone way up to the Supreme Court in arguing on rights issues as well. And this is our mandate. One is the legal awareness, where we conduct uh, at schools and uh, with women's organization and also uh, NGOs. And that's legal literacy programs, and basically through the means of street plays. And uh, we also publish, because publishing is one of the main aspects of the legal services clinic where we publish in the local language, the vernacular language, that's Kannada and Hindi as well, we are just taking up, where we publish the most recent updates in law. Because I think the, uh, the less privileged, in India particularly, they don't know English. They find it really difficult. So what we do is we try to translate it in the uh, vernacular language and then distribute the newsletters. This newsletter uh, goes to the neighborhood, the high court and the supreme court, and also the organizations across. And this is legal aid, advice to the clients. And other projects, I think uh, uh, those from US would obviously know this, but not much in the European context. That's uh, public interest litigation, something known as social action litigations. Uh, but I, uh, I think I'm proud to say that we have taken more than, I think, five cases and more than 15 cases to the consumer court. And, uh, and we've, in more than five cases, that social action litigation at the high court and the Supreme Court, and all the orders have been in our favor. And the juvenile justice courts, and this is a small example uh, in Karnataka where uh, the court which is supposed to try juveniles was not set up for nearly six years. I think it was our efforts that we went all the way to the uh, high court, then the, uh, it was set up within, I think, a period of three months. And we also publish handbooks, that's one of the things, and also we report. And this is one of the main aspects where uh, we do empirical research we go to the fields and we research whether the law have, laws have been implemented. Women and child welfare laws happen to be the most neglected aspect of all the policies, and we make an empirical report and submit these reports to the high courts and the supreme courts. They even go to the Ministry of Law and Justice, which does take note of it. And Uh, that's a picture of our street play. This is our clinic. Uh, I, I think I, I would like to thank our vice chancellor because uh, this year uh, there was a huge grant provided to renovate the whole clinic. Now we also have a client counseling center, particular to the, uh, uh, targeting women uh, who have faced domestic violence who come to the clinic and we do counsel them. Uh, these are some of the other projects that we have taken up. I think uh, the most uh, recent ones are the consumer law and the criminal law, 
which I, I mean a layman wouldn't know what are the criminal provisions in the first place. Now what we do is we publish small handbooks and which are not in writing. Uh, they are in a very, uh, they are in a very interactive cartoons where they know that, okay, you know, committing this offense leads to this particular punishment. They are in a very interactive way where even the children can, you know, refer to them. Yeah, and uh, we enroll uh, because uh, our campus is big and there, is, there are a lot of construction, uh, uh, you know, work happening on campus. Now, one of the projects we have taken up is to enroll them in schools as well and also have after hours tutoring. Yeah, this is one. And we have something known as, apart from legal literacy, we also have something known as financial literacy program. And the women you see here, they are, are uh, you know, uh, mess workers and the cleaners and you know, janitors on campus who, who didn't even have a bank account initially. I think through this program, they came to know that, okay, they can open the bank accounts and, you know, they can have uh, monthly deposits there and their <laughs> salary can go directly to the bank. And they can have a huge savings because particularly in India when women, I mean, like they are, you know the situation, they get the salary, they give it to the husband. So uh, husband and then that's, that, that's a different equation when you have a bank account. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. uh, prisons project is another beautiful project where we are assisted by the state ministry of law and justice where the state is actually uh, encouraging us to go to the prisons, the central prisons and uh, Although the law may, might be robust, but the implementation is the, the weaker part of it, where a lot of prisoners are uh, you know, put behind the bars, although their uh, period is already over, the under trial prisoners. So we try to obtain bail for those particular prisoners. And yeah, thank you. So this is an overview. And uh, just uh, a, sm a small bit about uh, MacGenet. So uh, it's my firm belief that you know it's not about the trophy and uh, it's, it's neither is it about the financial grant that we uh, get out of it. I think um, I believe it is about uh, being provided with a support system that McGenet provides, and it is an everlasting encouragement to continue the landmark projects that all the lo uh, all the colleges have been uh, doing. And uh, one of the most pressing issues for any for any of the social service initiatives is the need to be recognized. I think this particular thing, I think. McGenet and the Telos Network have been efficiently doing so over the years. I think we, uh, uh, my uh, thanks for that. And then um, also uh, w w through McGenet, I think the Legal Services Clinic and the Minnesota, I, I think this is a common for everyone, that we've gotten a platform to initiate ideas, however small or big they are, and they are being recognized. I think this is the first thing. The financial grants and everything comes later, that's secondary. So I think uh, Ma'am was speaking about uh, you know, the programs being recognized and everything. I think now uh, South India, I think most of them know, okay, who's the McJanet winner? I think it's okay, it's a clinic here out here. And they say, okay, what is McJanet? Okay, then the McJanet, they go and browse and you know, tell us not what. That's the best part of it. And um, the very process of applying for the McJanet was quite grueling and it was intellectually stimulating because we had to think about ideas, n not something, uh, totally theoretical, but something which is implementable. And I think one of the, uh, uh, in one of the plenary sessions, I think students, we did discuss that we want to discuss more ideas, but not just on the paper, something which is implementable. And I think uh, McJanet is trying to help us, you know, uh, implement it from the grassroots levels. And um, I, I thank the Telos Network and the McJanet Foundation for the same. Uh, good evening. Uh, my, let us start with uh, my university, National Law School of India University, first, first ranked uh, university in India. And for this university, our uh, Chief Justice of India is a Chancellor. And uh, with this, uh, the government of India has established uh, more than 10 centers uh, in the National Law School. So in that, uh, uh, within this particular national law school, this particular legal education, what we are providing, we are, uh, uh, I mean, delivering justice education, not uh, legal education, that is our idea. And legal service clinic uh, used as a lab, uh, especially in enacting laws. Uh, I will give you only one example, we have done a lot of uh, uh, work, only one example. In India, nowadays or uh, earlier also, misleading advertisements are very high. 
and uh, the whole community is exploited by these misleading advertisements like fairness cream, sun cream, uh, hair will grow within one week, slim, uh, height growth within one month. So these types of uh, uh, the advertisements and uh, the village people, illiterate people exploited by these advertisements. Then what we did, uh, I told my students uh, to select one cosmetics uh, of their choice and I took them for shopping also. So they selected one cosmetics depending on their tall claim, manufacturer's tall claim. And they selected and they applied on themselves according to the directions of the manufacturer on themselves for one month. And result was completely false. Whatever the tall claim was there, no one, uh, the product was, uh, I mean, uh, comes true. Then uh, we have not left there itself. Students sent a legal notice to all, these are all multinational companies, not small companies. All multinational companies, they sent a legal notice. And uh, L'Oreal was one of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, later, uh, the majority of them not responded. Some of them responded without, uh, I mean, uh, our satisfaction. Then I took the students to the consumer court and literally they filed a complaint to the consumer court against these multinational companies. Notices are served. Then uh, immediately they do these multinational companies appeared. Uh, I mean, these uh, multinational companies got uh, senior counsels for uh, their uh, uh, side. And our side, students are arguing in, uh, uh, in India, under Consumer Protection Act, consumer can argue their case. It's very simple and uh, summary proceedings. That's why students themselves are arguing the matter. In the first hearing itself, these uh, advocates threatened our students. See, you are in uh, uh, law school. We will file a complaint to the national, I mean, vice chancellor. They wrote a complaint to the vice chancellor also. These students are uh, d uh, damaging your uh, national law school first ranking reputation reputation, kindly take action against us. So, uh, I mean, our vice chancellor knows what we are doing uh, and because of uh, his full support, we are doing all those things. And later, uh, these cases are uh, pending. The, this is a uh, one stage. Second stage, I'm heading also the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, Government of India chair at National Law School. I collected all the data, what we filed, what we have done, empirical survey on these products, and what is the scientific background, scientific result of these things, and uh, the objections uh, written by, submitted by the opposite party. We, I submitted all these documents to Ministry of Consumer Affairs. Immediately, they took it very serious. Four regional conferences they conducted throughout India on this issue. And outcome was, yes, there is a need for amendment to the Consumer Protection Act because of weakness only these uh, manufacturers are exploiting. And after that, immediately the Minister of Consumer Affairs uh, uh, requested us, the consumer chair and uh, legal service clinic, uh, together to draft this particular amendment. Ultimately, we drafted and submitted to the government of India. Now, it is, uh, uh, a bill is uh, before the parliament. So in coming session, that particular bill may, uh, will pass. So this is one of the example. So with uh, this example, I will conclude. And I request my vice chancellor to say civil. Thank you. Hello, this is Professor Rao, vice chancellor of uh, National Law School of India University, the preferred destination of legal education <laughs> in the world. Well, we basically believe in what Martin Luther King said. If you seek peace, cultivate justice. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. With that professed objective, our legal services clinic has put its best foot forward by focusing only on one goal. That goal is, uh, it is not merely providing access to courts. Access to courts is only the first step because access to courts need not necessarily provide access to justice. Our ultimate goal is to see that uh, everyone has access to justice in the real sense of the term. And this evening's award has made our task formidable. We are grateful to you for recognizing National Law School of India University. National Law School of India University, whose avowed objective is to provide intellectually stimulating, 
professionally competent, and above all, socially relevant legal education. It's a very peculiar university. It is a university only with the faculty of law, single faculty university. And this experiment was started in 1988, and we are 25 years young today, because I believe institutions, unlike individuals, can never become old. They will always be young. And in the saga of 25 years, National Law School of India University, with its amazingly talented young students, uh, has uh, given many insights to make systems accessible to people who, by an accident called birth, are deprived of those opportunities. And today's uh, MacJanet Prize has made our task more onerous and more formidable. And certain things in life only have a beginning, they have no end. Our relationship with Talleris International has only a beginning. This civic engagement is mainly to make surroundings around us a better place to live in. And let me assure you on my behalf and on behalf of National Law School of India University that we will not leave even any tone unturned to promote the goal of peace and justice to everyone. Thank you very much, sir, for making this one. And a small insignia from National Law School of India University to the UHT. Yes, both of you, sir, please. We are 25 years and Silver Jubilee insignia. Good evening, um, and, and thank you for staying in. Um, I am standing here representing the Center for Rural Health at the University of the Vetbatersrand, uh, more importantly representing uh, my head of department, Ian Cooper, um, whose vision this program is based on. I was not at Vets at the time, I was somewhere else. And, uh, but he um, had aspirations to support students uh, from previously disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, in particular students from the rural areas. So I'm standing here um, to extend our gratitude uh, to the McJanet Foundation. Again, as with the previous uh, speakers, we really are grateful uh, for the privilege, for the honor that has been bestowed on us um, we are also fairly young. Um, the, the unit was started in 2002, and um, we then uh, started accepting students um, in 2004. I joined. Okay. All right, I got it. Thank you. Um, I joined the university in 2005. Now. Um, the reason why we established uh, the scholarship program was recognizing the challenges, the human resources challenges that face uh, rural areas, especially where I come from. Um, and also um, the head of department is a joint appointee with the, uni with, sorry, with the Northwest province. And so he had responsibilities and accountability to the province. And we had um, to identify strategies to address the challenges but also we base that on the fact that um, there is evidence um, that supports that if you take students from the rural areas, they're most likely to return to the rural areas and also most likely to provide a service um, and provide long-term solutions to the rural health uh, workforce. So we had to then um, negotiate with the university. My VC was here this morning. Um, so he spoke about um, the, 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 the strategies of the university. And um, so we are now streamlining the focus to the needs uh, of um, the people around health issues, looking at health outcomes uh, for those provinces. So the scholarship was uh, then undertaken as a pilot project, looking at two districts, one in the Northwest province, the other one in Limpopo. And um, it was not an easy task. In the first year, instead of having 20 students, there were nine students. At the end of the first year, instead of having 100% achievement, 
um, only 56% uh, managed uh, to pass their exams. In 2014, um, we have managed to graduate a number of students, and um, after much persuasion, we launched the alumni of the program, and um, we also are proud to say that 74% of our graduates have returned back to their own communities, are providing a service, and uh, we had the privilege um, of uh, having the MEC for Health in the Northwest Province, um, who had this to say that health is a social service and not a business. In this service, we need people uh, with a living conscience, people who have a social and political consciousness, and uh, people who want to save lives. So that is our mandate and that is our responsibility. And um, so what we do is that we support students based on what they choose to study. But now, um, since we have been um, running this and managing this program for a few years, we have now told the province that they need to identify the kind of personnel that they need for, the, for, for their particular area. So instead of students uh, coming in and saying, I want to study medicine, because most of our graduates are, 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 are medical graduates, we are saying, what is the need of the province? Do you have enough pharmacists? Do you have enough um, uh, occupational therapists, um, dietetics, and so on? Because what we've realized is that everybody wants to, start, to, to study medicine for the privilege, but the communities have a different need. So um, there is that uh, now mandate, um, or maybe rather an advice for them to consider that. Um, we are involved in the selection of students. We sit with the districts, with the managers, and also there is community um, participation, and we agree uh, on which students to choose from w for which university, because we work with three universities. These are some of our graduates. Um, as, um, I mean, if you will have copies of the slides, you will see that um, they qualified in different disciplines. Um, Though we graduated um, the first student in 2006, she joined an existing service. Um, where we had an impact was with the student who graduated in 2010, uh, who says um, in an email that she wrote to me, I started work today at Nick Borenstein Hospital. I arrived here to find that there has not been a physio since 2004. I have to start my own department from scratch. The thought is exciting and scary at the same time. I will do my best and hope it's good enough. I will keep in touch and let you know how the department is doing. So this is the kind of evidence um, that we're getting, um, or rather testimonies that we're getting from the students. And in fact, this student um, later on sent pictures of a department with bare walls where she had to find paint, she had to find equipment, and she still managed to extend her services um, to, to, by, by providing a mobile service to that particular community. So, I mean, with um, stories like these, um, you, you know that you have made a difference. And um, I, I need to say that um, where we've seen most of this coming through is with allied health graduates, because with medical students, they're joining an existing service. But these uh, graduates are starting services from scratch. Now, um, we were asked to um, explain how we are going to spend the money. So what has happened over the years is that um, we have been working with the students. Um, and and as, as I said earlier on, when I joined the university, the, the pass rate was 56%. So it was my responsibility um, to improve the pass rate. We're now averaging um, 80, higher 80s, 90 depending um, on, on the students. Because for instance, in some universities, a student may owe a course, uh, but have to stay back and repeat the year. So that will be considered to be a fail. So it's not necessarily that they are not coping. Um, so in the early years, I provided all the mentoring. Um, I had to develop a program you know, for the students. So we met on a monthly basis. They had to report uh, on what they've been doing. We monitored their academic performance, and they had um, also to set targets for the next time. So if they got 60%, I would say, okay, fine. Um, let's see what you get the next time. 
Um, one of the students um, said when we met that um, he used to be scared of me. Um, so I said, it's fine. So I give them permission. When we have these meetings, we meet with them um, twice a year, and I say to them, you have a right to, ha to hate me, uh, but if you achieve your goal, that is the most important thing. I don't mind. I know that the relationship can be repaired later on. So with the money that we received, uh, for which we are um, very grateful for, we want to um, catch up with our publications. You know, with universities, you either publish or perish. And so there is that little bit um, that we need to satisfy, but also for ourselves, uh, because now we're losing out. Other people are moving ahead of us, and yet they started after uh, we, we launched our program. So we have a lot of draft articles um, that need to be finalized. We have presented in a number of conferences. Um, so I think that uh, we have enough evidence um, to share with the rest of the world and say that um, this is what is out there. The beauty about it is that um, in our acknowledgments, we will be saying that uh, the McJanet Foundation provided uh, for us to get to this point. Um, so, I mean, it's not only the draft articles um, that um, we've started working on. We, we know that uh, our graduates have their own personal experiences. I'm in touch with them. They consult me about relationships, um, studying further, because in our logo, we encourage them to be lifelong learners. So we have a few students who have uh, registered for postgraduate studies. Uh, some of them still um, do consult on that. Uh, the only thing that I say to them is that uh, your partner is accountable to me. Um, so, I mean, it's, well, it's just a joke. Um, but we also need to assess our impact on the communities. As I said, in some of these places, there have been no services prior to them um, going back to their communities. So we need to be looking at that, but we also need to look at their personal experiences of the service. We have ideas, there's anecdotal evidence uh, of um, what are the challenges, uh, you know, certainly the politics uh, are an issue for some of our graduates, uh, but we need to be uh, documenting that and sharing it uh, with the rest of the world. Um, I, I need to say that it has not always been easy. I have had to go on my knees at times. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I think I was pleased to hear that um, the, 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 the couple, the McJanets, were a frugal uh, couple. Uh, but they believed in their product. They believed in the investment um, that they made at the time and the commitment that they made. So um, as the Center for Rural Health and as the University of the Vet Badars Rand, um, we are grateful that we are awarded this and also grateful to the TALA Network um, um, for the invitation to participate in this conference. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maureen Keegan, and I am the program administrator at the Tower Network and also responsible for managing the annual McJanet Prize. As the manager of the McJanet Prize for Global Citizenship, for the past two years, I've had the privilege of reviewing more than 100 nominations that have been submitted for the prize. The three programs that you just heard about represent only a small fraction of the dynamic and innovative civic and community engagement programs that exist at Tower Network member universities. With such excellent nominations, it is always a daunting challenge to narrow the pool to finalists and winners. As Venka mentioned earlier, since 2009, 38 programs from 20 different countries have been recognized for their outstanding student leadership, impacts, and commitments to their community. I know that there are a number of people who are attending the conference today who uh, represent programs or universities that are previous McJanet Prize winners. If there's anyone in the audience who represents a program that has previously won a McJanet Prize or a university that has pre previously received a McJanet Prize, I would ask you to please stand now so we can recognize you. Thank you. It is great to have so many examples of global citizenship here in South Africa with us. I know that many more of you have submitted nominations for the McJanet Prize, and I would like to thank you for sharing your excellent work with the Tawar Network. It is truly inspiring to see such a diverse range of programs every year. The McJanet Prize is now entering its seventh year, 
And I, along with my colleagues, look forward to learning more about the civic engagement, community engagement, social responsibility, and service learning activities taking place at Tower Network member universities as we review nominations for the 2015 McJanet Prize. Nomination forms are available on the Tower Network website now and will be accepted until January 23, 2015. Winners of the 2015 McJanet Prize will be announced in May. Each Tower Network member university may nominate up to two programs based at their institution that have existed for at least two years. Nominations are judged on a number of criteria, including student leadership, university support, community partnership and involvement, sustainability, demonstrated positive impact on students, demonstrated positive impact on the community, as well as geographic diversity. If you have any questions about the McChanet Prize, please email the address located on the back of the program, or you can come find me over the next few days. And I hope that many of you in the audience today will submit nominations in the coming weeks.